All right, before we kick off things in this edition of the vlog, I have to point out about last edition of the vlog. I don't think I've ever received more vlog comments, DMs, tweets, in-person messages, and basically every other form of communication. I think there were some carrier pigeons involved at some point, reminding me that I had uh, a hand that didn't make any sense on the vlog last week. And it's a pretty simple explanation for those of you that have yet to receive it. I have now done 221 vlogs. And over the course of those vlogs, I think this has happened probably three times, maybe four, where I just kind of get into a groove of editing these vlogs. And I fail to realize that I have screwed up the graphics. Obviously, it takes both me screwing up the graphics and not even realizing that I've said the wrong thing. Because when I go off of my notes from the actual session, uh, usually I get them spot on, but occasionally I mess them up. So uh, in this case, I know it was pocket queens against pocket sevens, but what the board was is going to have to remain a mystery. I don't have the exact board apparently written down. I thought I did, but it obviously wasn't what I showed. One of the cards was different. I'm not sure which one it was but he did not have a straight. I felt very confident about that. But that is the simple explanation there. I have to show you an absolutely insane hand that happened coming up at the end of this vlog, one of the most unforgettable of the year to this point. But first, part five of NV to AC. You gotta love this patch. Fucking amazing. South. Not too far out of Roanoke. Just need to find a trucker out of Philly and have a nice long toke. And as you may have seen, I just passed Johnson City, Tennessee. <laughs> Heading into one of the final stops on NV to AC, and that's one of the ones where I expect to have some of the best action. Cherokee, North Carolina. Harris property there. It's a big tournament stop for uh, circuit grinders, I believe. It'll certainly be my first time there. It's my first time in the state of North Carolina as I close in on its border here today. Let's head on in. Let's see if we can shoot a block. What keeps you up at night, yeah. Make all the demons quiet, yeah. We were built to thrive, yeah. All right, one hell of a crazy drive in through the jungles of North Carolina. And I was lucky enough to get an electric car charging spot this time, unlike in Maryland. So hopefully that's a good omen as we come in here to Cherokee, North Carolina. By the way, one hell of a sports book here. We got two, two, five games going on. I'm hoping the action's going to be good. Uh, be a short wait here, apparently, and then I'm going to jump in one of them. By the way, someone asked me where I was during this portion of the trip. And I responded just like Matt Damon in the movie Air and just said, North Carolina. <laughs> By the way, that might be the first post-COVID movie that I have truly enjoyed. Ben Affleck, great director. I'd say it's somewhat fair to say that Cherokee, North Carolina is indeed located in the middle of a jungle. It's actually a biodiverse rainforest covering parts of Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina. The casino itself wasn't just a zoo with seemingly thousands of people there. It's also massive, though I like the fact that I got some steps in just from walking from the parking garage to the poker room. Like most poker rooms, this one is adjacent to the sports book, but unlike most sports books, this one has 10 out of 10 quality chairs and private rooms, which could potentially be kind of cool. The poker room was in the 30 table range. It had those weird rails where the felt doesn't actually reach them. And the felt seemed more like something you would putt on as opposed to play poker. But I will give them credit for doing something that all poker rooms should do, and that's make the cup holders bigger. 
it's not a car. There's no fear of spilling. And then people like me can fit a water bottle in them, and guys like Slick can actually fit his drink in there, a problem he often faces. Also, credit to the casino for being smoke-free. That should be all casinos, as I've been saying for years. Slot players are addicted to both things, and they're not going to stop playing slots or smoking just because they can't do both simultaneously. Anyway, I would wait for an hour to get this seat, maybe even more than that. That was kind of a theme on this trip, with most of these rooms switching to eight-handed tables as a way to increase rake. And by the way, they are really good at collecting rake at this casino. 10%, $7 max with a bonus tax. That's pretty rough. I'd finally get a seat and immediately be in a six-handed game. That happens to me a lot, by the way. You wait forever, and then you get in the game, and it's immediately short. It's kind of bizarre. As I sat down, the guy across the table didn't say anything to me. But all of a sudden, he was discussing how long of a drive it was in from Atlantic City. I wonder why that is. I'd start off the session promptly losing $100 running a bluff on a guy who sure as hell wasn't folding his King-8 suited preflop, and once he hit a king, well, there was absolutely no way. The first hand I would get on camera would come against that same player. Playing six-handed, he opens to 15 under the gun. It folds to me in the big blind with pocket kings. I'd raise to 50, and as expected, he makes the call. So with 100 in, the flop is jack, 9-3, all spades. I bet 60 here, and he thinks about it for about 10 seconds before finally finding a fold. The lineup kind of sucked at first, but then we got a guy sitting down who would open to $75 on the first hand he played, so that seemed like good news. I tried to get involved with him by raising sixes, but when the flop came out queen jack eight against him and one other guy, I was forced to exit stage left. I then call a three bet with ace queen and the queen of diamonds and got a 10-7-3 all diamond board. Fortunately, I didn't put in a dime post-flop, as one opponent flopped a king-high flush, and the other was a non-believer and gave him his entire stack. I pick up ace-queen again, and after we get an under-the-gun limp, I raised a 30 from the cutoff. A grinder on the button decides to give me action here. It was never something I liked. The limper calls also, so with 90 in, the board is queen-jack-jack to diamonds. Under the gun bets out for $10 here. I raised to 40 with top pair and the button cold calls me. Under the gun doesn't actually fold his cards. He just walks out of the room, killing his hand. So I hate everything that has happened here so far. I've gotten action from the guy I didn't want to get action from and I've lost the guy I wanted to keep in there. Turn is a six and I bet 60. And as I kind of expected, the button raises me making it 150. Again, this was the last guy at the table that I wanted giving me action. If he had trips, it makes perfect sense to just flat the flop with the other guy who was seemingly double parked still in the hand. So I opted to believe that he had it, and I folded my hand. I'm sure some commenters won't like that, but I felt pretty confident in the lay down. I would then raise ace-jack first to act in the small blind, with the button straddling. Can't say I'm a fan of the Mississippi format, but it is indeed commonplace in most of these East Coast rooms. I make it 30, and under the gun, who in this hand is fourth to act, jams all in for 200 more. I decide against doubling him up. The guy who had been double parked busts two hands later, and it was against the guy who doubled up earlier. The guy who was destined to punt does indeed do so two hands later. And it was against that guy who had already doubled up. That part just didn't quite seem fair to me, but I digress. This is a mid-session update. I have decided upon careful deliberation that poker games that suck are significantly less fun than poker games that don't suck. And this update is over. Button raises to 15, and I make the call with pocket sixes in a hand in which I'd get a late start filming. 
With 30 in, the board comes out ace, ace, four, rainbow, and I check. Button thinks about it and checks behind, so I'd get a free look at a turn, which was a slightly above average turn card for my hand. I decide to just come out and overbet the pot here, making it 50. He thinks about it for a second and makes the call. So with 130 in, the river is a nine, and I bet 100. He thinks for a minute and jams all in for just over 100 more here. So after I make the call, it became a $540 pot. He has ace queen here, which is what I expected. The slow play burns him, and the pot gets shipped over to me. Though I was kind of saying to myself, out of all the hands to be against a short stack, why did it have to be that one? This was the last room on the East Coast I was going to go to, and at every other room, someone had said something to me about this vlog. And this guy kept the streak alive. I asked him what his name was, and he simply said, Butter. The lineup was extremely grinder heavy. The best hand I would get dealt over the next 90 minutes was Queen Nine of Clubs, with which I would call a raise in a multi-way pot. I'd end up turning the second nut flush draw, but that would end up costing me another $60. I'd get moved to the other table with the must-move in effect. I'd sit down there, stuck about 200 on the day, wishing I'd knitted it up some more at the same level some of these grinders had been. I'd be pretty card dead there for the first hour until I opened to 30 with a couple of aces. The button is a European grinder who makes the call, and with 60 in, the flop comes out, jack, seven, eight, two hearts, and I bet 40. He doesn't think too long with it and makes the call. So with 140 in, the turn is another seven. This time, I bet 70, and once again, he's not going anywhere. So with 280 in, the river is yet another 7. What a dream card for me. I'm going to bet big here, but how much? This guy is good, but still has to be concerned that I could have queens, kings, or aces here on this jack-high board, which is what I'm assuming he probably has in the form of top pair. So I bet 175 here, assuming that he will pay off with a jack, which sure enough, he does do creating a $630 pot which gets shipped in this direction. I'd play for about another 45 minutes before racking up and booking the win. All right, wrapping up the session, booking a $303 win. It's kind of like I used to talk with my buddy Cordell about. Shout out to the Players Casino in Ventura, California. Sometimes it's a game of $300 wins. And on this trip, that's been the case. All right, so here's the deal. As this East Coast swing nears its end, I had only a couple of other things on this trip that I just had to do. Obviously, one was go see Fallout Boy in St. Louis, and the other is... I've got to take the Breaking Bad slash Better Call Saul tour in Albuquerque. Actually, I'm just not sure how much Better Call Saul they're going to show on that tour, unfortunately, but I got to believe it'll be at least a little. I've always wanted to do that, and I just don't know the next time I'm ever going to be swinging through Albuquerque, which was always my plan to do on the way back on this journey. So I've got a couple of days to get there to make this tour. And I'd like to get started tomorrow night. So I want to get a couple of more hands vlogged if I can pull that off here at Cherokee, North Carolina. And then hit the road. And it's going to be basically two and a half full days of driving from North Carolina to New Mexico. My second session at Cherokee was an earlier start than the first. That actually meant there were fewer profitable grinders and more casual types. So I considered that good news because usually the grinders get in a little bit later and a lot of the more casual guys enjoy that 11 a.m. start. After not playing a single hand of note for the first hour, I'd get dealt pocket kings and raised to 30. And then, as you can see, the cutoff jams all in for $238. Folds back to me, and obviously I make the call. So we have a $470 pot, and I'm against ace-king. So I would just need to fade an ace to bust this player. I decided against holding my phone up to show the board because... I had been told there was a likelihood that I would get bitched at for shooting video in this room, so I just let the video roll from this angle, but the flop did come out ace high. Right in the window, that ace came, and the pot would get shipped over to him. Then I would get dealt ace-king and raised to 35. Five 
players call, thinking that I was on tilt. And this is going to be a shock, but I'd get an 8-6-5 flop and was forced to fold, losing to pocket sevens. Ace, king again, I'd get two callers pre-flop, and this time I would fire a $60 C-bet on 10-7-3, and I would get jammed on and be forced to fold it yet again. You gotta love ace-king. I can't win with it, and I can't beat it. I'd raise to 35, king-queen on the button. I'd get called by plus one, who had limped in, and so with 75 in, the board comes out, queen-10-4, one heart. He takes forever before finally checking, so I bet 45 here, and now he doesn't think too long before check raising 100 more. This is definitely a close spot, but I decided to make the call, so with 365 in, the turn is the jack of hearts, and now he checks again. I figured my chances of facing the double check raise here were pretty low against this guy, but I also didn't think he was going to fold any of the hands that beat me on the flop. So, being in position here, I opted to just check this back and see the river, and unfortunately, it comes the biggest brick in the deck, the deuce of spades, and he checks again. Knowing that he's never folding ace-queen, I found myself partially wishing I jammed all in on the turn, but as I mentioned, I didn't think that was going to result in him folding ace-queen. But I do check it back, and that is the hand that I lose to. I'd find out after walking to the car that they have a policy of picking up players if they leave for more than 10 minutes without saying anything. I was gone 11 minutes, and they were in the process of racking up my chips despite the fact there was a seat open. Just to add that to the list of the many things that would put Mike Nelson on tilt that I saw on poker rooms across the country on this trip. When I made that trip to the car, I was doing so to grab some food, and I actually didn't grab more money. So after I'd lose a couple of small pots, I would add on to the game, but I only had 300 in my pocket at that point. So I was in the game for 1300 we get a guy sit down on my immediate left. He was actually the first true grinder of the day to show up, and I'm not just mentioning that for the hell of it. The low jack makes it 25, and I have pocket queens on the button and make it 75. And he decides to cold call my $75 raise. Low jack completes also. So at 225 in, the flop comes jack, three, four, two clubs, and it gets checked to me. With my overpair, I bet four green chips here. Small line calls and the low jack goes out. I was hoping the opposite would happen. With 425 in, the turn is an offsuit 10. He checks to me once again. Now, I have less than a pot size bet left here, and obviously no clear idea what he has here. He could have ace jack, and he could also have a lot of draws. I don't really know how he plays, but it's not as if I can bet 200 here and fold to a raise given the stack sizes. And by the way, before I did anything, I found myself thinking about how much I hate short stacked poker. In the hand I lost with the pocket kings, I would have saved money had he been deeper, given that ace I flop. In this case, it's my own short stack that's causing the problem. A short stack created by simply never having the best hand the entire session. Anyway, after thinking about it, I decided that this was a spot to go with it. So, I bet it all. If I faded the snap call, I would likely be in good shape. I don't fade the snap call. So, we have a $1,300 pot playing against pocket jacks, and that is how this session and my East Coast swing comes to an end. All right, you heard me talk about it over the past few vlogs. I kept getting in games on the East Coast that weren't that great. A lot of grinders in them. I had to kind of grind out wins myself, usually booking small wins, but pretty much all of that hard work erased in this one session at Cherokee, North Carolina, booking a $1,300 loss, three hours of play. I did not get dealt the best hand once. Unless you count the couple of times I scooped the blinds, not one time that I hold the best hand in this game. I guess it was only uh, likely that I would have one of these sessions that just goes in a disastrous fashion for me here on this trip. And sure enough, I did. So I bet 100 into 230, and I also figured that 
if he didn't pair his jack, like he's not gonna fold a jack, right? But if he didn't pair his jack and he had some sort of high club like an ace or a king or something like that, what that means, if he doesn't pair up here on the river, is that there's less of a chance that I am bluffing with the club. All right, cruising through the rainforest of North Carolina, leaving Cherokee, and I am listening to the latest episode as you just turn up the Crush Live poker podcast. It's the best place you can go on the internet for strategy discussion when it comes to what to do in live poker games, and specifically the size of games that I play, and chances are the size of games that you play if you're watching this vlog. You can always get 25% off a basic or premium subscription for life, or you can get a discount on the elite subscription level as well. All you gotta do is click the link in the description below. Good to have some CLP for this long drive ahead of me over the next couple of days. I'm here on Highway 40, a road that I'm gonna be seeing a lot of. We got a flash bulb like never before. We got lightning like crazy in the middle of Tennessee. If you never see me again, you'll know why. All right, so that hand at Cherokee, North Carolina, certainly one of the lowlights of 2023 to this point. Not quite sure what I should have done there, but it definitely stung. But let's tell you about one of the highlights of the year to this point. It came at Peppermill, 0510 in a game that had a very specific and obviously action-packed lineup. And the game flow was just at an all-time high in terms of the amount of hands being raised, amount of hands being played. So the hand would actually take place when I looked down in the big blind at a couple of nines, and the straddle was on in early position. And the hijack makes it $330 over that straddle. And it's back to me with the nines. Now it's only a question of raising or calling here. Folding is not an option at all based on how this game is being played. So he has about 1,500 or so behind. And I had every reason to think that 1,500 was going to be going in sooner rather than later. But either way, I elected to call that raise and see what developed on the flop, hoping I would get a relatively dry board or get lucky and have nines be an overpair to it. And in that case, I was definitely planning on getting all of the money in against this particular opponent. So we have a pot of $660 and a flop that comes king, eight, nine, all spades. So I drill a set, but it is a monotone board. I check and he slides in his entire stack, which at this point consists only of black chips, I believe. I snap call and ask him if he wants to run it twice. He says, no. I say, are you sure I have a set? And he says, okay, we'll do twice. The first board in what is now a $3,700 pot would not come out the way I was looking for it to come out, as a spade would indeed peel off, as you can see. The second board would result in no spades peeling off. I'm unsure if I'm going to either chop this pot, unlikely, but it's possible I could be getting scooped, or as obviously I was hoping, I would end up winning both. And that was the case as he mucks his hand showing only one king and the pot gets shipped over to me. Hey, do me a favor. You were thinking about playing poker when you're on the go, consider playing with me on the Club GG app. GG Poker is the name of the game when it comes to poker in the world and in the United States of America. Obviously, you have to play on Club GG. And I got the group for you, Donkeys United. That's where you'll find me. You can deal with the hosts on Telegram. Just use my club code and referral code in the description below. And if you mention this vlog, they will give you a 10% deposit bonus. Donkeys United on Club GG. 
Also, follow on Instagram at Ben Deach and hit those like and subscribe buttons and tune in next week for the finale of NV to AC. I've got an itch I can't scratch. I'm missing a piece that completes a whole part of me. An open wound scar to see. Everybody come here, gather round. Welcome to the freak show, the best in town. What the hell's wrong with me? I don't get along with anybody, honestly. I've been living in my own head constantly. Thoughts jumbled round. Think I need a new lobotomy. Wait. All these thoughts are too negative. I don't want to get lost in the sedative. Gotta show them what I got. I'm competitive. You know I'm about to go off. I won't let them win. I'll take a stab. I want to chase a bag. I want to wait. I can change all the things I left.